Hey, Reef Builders, welcome to episode number 79 of the Reef Therapy Podcast. Today, we're going to get some updates on our systems, what's going on in the hobby. Uh, We've also got Sarah Stevens, who's back on the podcast. She's on a very special mission with the Florida Reef Track this week and uh, also dodging hurricanes in the process. Uh, If you could, please like, subscribe, and hit that bell notification so you know when new episodes pop up. If you're on the YouTube channel, if you are on any other audio-only platforms, just go ahead and subscribe to that uh, so you get those podcasts automatically downloaded every single week. Let's get into it, guys. Raj, how are you feeling this week? (laughs) Well, apparently there's a new strain of COVID going around and um, it paid me a visit. So I had that going for me and uh, I didn't work all week. Um, got piles of emails and text messages and calls to return. So, you know, that, that, that's that been fun. Exactly so is this, what I needed. Is this like, uh, like fever, chills, cough, all that kind of stuff? Or like, what are your symptoms on this? So I can just look out for it. Cause it's probably it, mine was a little different because I didn't get, uh, I didn't get a fever, but, um, grueling headache, which ended up over the past few days, then turned into a migraine, um, runny nose, just beat. I'm so weak. Um, you know, like, like a, almost like the flu, but for some reason I didn't get a fever. Gotcha. But it was uh, it, it was a beast. Like the first time I got COVID, it you know I was over it in a day, and then you had the the lingering effects. But this one put me out pretty hard. Okay. So well, yeah, just it's fun stuff. Out for the, that yeah, enjoy it. When, <laughs> well, when I know the news the, like the news started talking about a new strain, and I was like, well, I mean that happens often where the news is blowing something up. But I mean, it's, I guess it's real. <laughs> So, yes. <laughs> um, speaking of the news and blowing something up, it seems like this uh, this hurricane that just what, what was it? Adalia is that what they were calling yeah. it? Adalia um, just came through Florida, and Sarah, who normally is in Colorado, is not in Colorado. She is volunteering some time down in uh, the Keys right now. Uh, tell us about the hurricane. You guys were you went through it. And you said it wasn't too bad. I mean, we were pretty far from it so we were just expecting storm surge uh rain out days some gusty winds but we got really lucky um we thought we were going to have a full day where we couldn't do any field work or um we had beautiful sunshine and nice light breezes and it made it actually kind of bearable to be working out under the sun (laughs) for us uh tampa did not get so lucky it seems like a lot of other places too got totally wrecked yeah well and and i'm thinking to myself as you're like you're pulling coral out and we'll get into that and putting them into greenhouses and you know kind of what seems to be a structure that's easily mowed over by a hurricane uh so i'm having all of these like visuals in my head of you know the efforts that are taking place uh, to save the coral and the florida reef tract and just being blown away by this hurricane but that no damage really to report on None down here. Um, It's Florida, right? They're in the Keys. They understand the beasts that they are working with. So they have some really uh, great, effective ways to uh, weather the storm. Yeah. It was funny because, like, the the hurricane that hit California (laughs) earlier, uh, you know, it landed as a tropical storm, I think. And I, I would they say the last one was like 1923 or 1937 or something like that. And people are, you know, if there's any precipitation in California, period, and especially in Southern California, they go, they go crazy. Uh, no offense. It's like to an our... inch of snow in Alabama. It's <laughs> yeah. like, if, if you're not expecting it and you're never experienced it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's like Georgia with snow. It shuts down. Yeah. 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 No Atlanta point to stay bit. home. <laughs> so do you, are you guys going to get any of the any of this uh, remnants raj coming through atlanta any we've got storms um we've had thunderstorms coming through so i don't know if that's related or not but we've had lots of storms lately anyway so it doesn't seem much different to me yeah every once in a while we'll get one that comes straight up through louisiana and you know it'll just rain on us in st louis for days you know because <laughs> they slow down significantly over land Stall out. <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> and I, I think it was the first we have like this uh, retention area in the back of our house 
and the homeowners before us were like, oh, no, it never fills up. It's fine. It's <laughs> I need to show you guys video of like the first two weeks in the house. I think it was Francis maybe that came through here. And it was just like rain for two days, but we had a water feature in the backyard all of a sudden. <laughs> water coming in the basement, which oh, it was crazy. Uh, it was we, it was nuts. We had one uh, hurricane come through. I don't know, in the past I think five years or so, and I remember our friend Mitch was texting me. He's like, "Are you you know prepping for it because it's supposed to come through?" I'm like, "Whatever, dude. I'm at the top of a hill." You know? <laughs> screw the hurricane. Nothing can really happen up here. And we're renovating the basement at that point. So I had a whole bunch of stuff and storage in the backyard and a hurricane comes through and just wipes out all kinds of stuff. And I lost so much stuff back there and a lot of my reef books and, you know, stuff that's out of print now. And I've been looking uh, on eBay to see if I can find copies of it. But and then I remember having a, or no, I think I posted a, a pictures of the books that I lost and just kind of griping about it online. And Mitch jumped all over it, screenshot my text. I was like, oh, screw the hurricane, huh? You're at the top of the hill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those those old reef books are hard to find, A, and B, yeah. if you do, they're expensive. Yeah. Like they, they charge a lot of money for those things. I mean, it reminds me of can, college textbooks. <laughs> yeah. You can get lucky. You you just have to constantly be looking for them. Yeah. Um, like some of like the, the used book sites, I'll just go through and type in like just different authors I'm looking for, like Martin Moe or yeah. Charles Delby. Like, and you can sometimes stumble across a treasure for like $8 that they don't really know is worthwhile. So yeah. always be looking. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's jump right into some some tank talk, some coral talk. Uh, Raj, anything to report on your end? <laughs> I'm telling you, it's a slow process. <laughs> it's painfully slow, and, and and I feel bad. Like every time I'm not making progress, then I'm like, oh my god, I'm gonna have to tell everybody that I haven't made progress like i'm being publicly shamed every week that well, i can ask you a different question but we might get reamed for not talking about corals that's right we need to get into the coral talk real quick yes yeah, so I, I i've done absolutely zero this week gotcha sarah anything uh anything new at butterfly pavilion anything new that you guys are working on or new insects or bugs or anything like that uh any tanks going up anything exciting uh, we're currently prepping right now for our big October event. So it's a spider takeover of our facility. So we have a huge exhibit in our Wings of the Tropics, which is usually just butterflies, where you can come face to face with giant orb weaving spiders. Um, so that's always a really fun, cool experience that we only do in October. As far as coral, um, nothing really big or new changing in our coral there, but definitely working with some really cool coral here in the Keys. Uh, and that's been a really fun, challenging experience. So. Yeah. Did you get the uh, $30 million you needed for the expansion? Not yet. Still looking really? for that bug billionaire. <laughs> Working on it. Sorry. <laughs> You're just trying to deflect heat from your tank. Yes. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> These aren't comparable, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I love. How dare I, you not get thirty million yet? What is wrong with you? Just what showing that you know you haven't made progress either. That's all. <laughs> no, we've made progress. We just had our gala, bud. <laughs> I love. I love when zoos uh, do like Halloween related stuff. I always think that that's that's really fun. Uh, the fact that it's spider related just makes me want to burn it all to the ground. Um, because I know some of those. So things. rude. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't tell me, too. you can't tell me you've never had nightmares about spiders all escaping their enclosures and oh, sleeping absolutely. on your face. Absolutely. <laughs> the first year we did this exhibit, I like woke up in the middle of the night and thought a giant orb weaver was like coming down on my head. And I just hid under my I like I woke up hiding under my covers. You just yeah. get over it. Immersion therapy, no. right? Yeah. You, you deal with them enough. <laughs> <laughs> Even the uh, Japanese spider crabs creep me out big time. You seen those guys? Like they're they're big, the huge they're guys. Big. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. God. Can't trust a spindly. <laughs> it's a big giant. Nope. 
<laughs> uh, I've been ta- I've been taking the kids um, over the weekends. We'll do night walks around the house with flashlights, and it's been really fun to see all the the creatures that are out at night. I I feel like the last time I personally did this was when I was probably a kid or a teenager. We go. We go hunt, you know, frog hunting or whatever, and go see if we could find some big bullfrogs and stuff. But we've seen we've seen some pretty fun stuff: toads and snakes, and uh, the pill bug population is insane in our mulch pile. Really? It's crazy how many are out at night. Um, but that's been a fun like educational experience for the kids, um, just to kind of go out and discover and have a little adventure in the backyard. So we don't have to go far for that. Although they do have to stay up a little bit later to do so. So yeah. um, bugs are accessible. Awesome. Everybody yeah. can find one in their backyard. Yeah. Do you uh, Google the bugs afterwards or what you find? Yeah, we, I, I'm always like, okay, we need to log this. So we'll take a picture of, you know, the toad or the, you know, we saw a garter snake last time. That was fun. Um, and then we'll go back in and we'll, we'll look them up and, you know, We've got some big slugs, man. Huge slugs just hanging out everywhere. Um, Leo had fu- had found some really small ones during the day. But <laughs> we got we got the night the, the ones that come out at night are very large. So I don't know. It's just it's fun. It's it's a good experience for them. So uh, if you got kids, no you should try it out. Cool because they. I mean, everything about them is kind of cool, right? Their scientific name. The what is it? The armadillo dile. Or die day, yeah. right? Armadillidium. Yeah, yeah, it's something like little that, yeah. like arm. It's like armadillo, basically. Like, like a little armadillo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they're, they're, well, they're there's a, a bunch of pod. yeah, which is cool. Land-based crustacean. Yes. Yeah. Isn't that neat? <laughs> there's so many types of pill bugs too. Like there's like rubber ducky pill bugs. I don't rubber duck, ducky isopods. I don't know if you've ever seen them, but. They look like little rubber duck. Like they, their yeah. face looks kind of like a little duck. They're the cutest thing in the world. It's like the world of the world of nudibranch. Nudibranchs, you know. There's all these. Uh, yeah. There was a picture Variations. floating around a couple weeks ago of this uh, nudie that had like a cartoon face to it, and of course it was beautiful and had like yellow and pink and all this stuff. But yeah, the, those are those are fun to watch too or look at. <clears throat> pill bugs are like specially bred they're like the clownfish of like the bug world you know how like people will specially breed their clownfish to get different morphs things like that people do the same exact thing with isopods with their pill bugs okay i know that they're used in like terrariums a lot <laughs> i didn't do it <laughs> <laughs> hey you get really cool colors Cool colors, variations. There's like dairy cow isopods. There's magic potion. They also name them weird names too. They fit right in the reef hobby. That's great. Love that. Is there a holy grail? I told you they were cool. <laughs> I feel like the rubber duckies are definitely highly coveted. They sell. They'll sell like six of them for three hundred dollars. It's like oh four gosh. level pricing for wow. these tiny little. Yeah, it's nuts. If you can look behind me, you can see that there is water in this tank. You see this? There's water back there. Hydro test is happening currently. (laughs) And I went against you, Raj, and I put RODI in instead of tap water from the hose because I was like, I don't want to just waste 160 gallons of tap water. (laughs) Yeah, I want the the more expensive stuff to waste. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm not wasting it, though. See, what I'm going to do is right behind me oh. over this side, I have a container. I'm going to pump it out, mix it in here, aquascape it, uh, manage all the cords and do all the things and put all the electronics on. And then once I'm done with that and put the salt water back in, so I'm not wasting it, I promise you. Yeah, see, but that wouldn't have worked without that container. That's true, that but I have it. You're conveniently hiding link, behind you, your back. You have totally wasted how much? Because what's your R do I R do I uh, like good to waste? It's not good. It's not awesome. Yeah. See, so instead of 160 <laughs> gallons, you were like, yeah, I just wasted a thousand gallons on this. It's okay. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> but it could have been have, tap water. <laughs> yeah, I would have had to do right. it anyway. So I don't know what you're talking about. I I hate you now again. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so we had a couple comments kind of surrounding our talk last week, which was, well, it, we touched upon the whole live versus dry rock and someone said, uh, Ram Ramesis said, would it be possible to get Raj's methodology on how to cycle a tank with dry rock? I've not had good luck with it. My experience was the same as Keith's bacterial blooms, white slime took over the tank. I would love to use this going forward, but it just hasn't been a good experience. Wow. I've never experienced that, but you know, I always use, um, I always add bacteria. So Fritz makes some pretty good products. Um, when it used to be here, there was a French company, uh, Protobio that had a good product that I used. Um, so that there's, you know, bacteria is concentrated bacteria that you can use. And then you have the stuff that's just on the shelf and then you have the refrigerated stuff. If you can get the refrigerated stuff, that's a lot better. Um, then I try to also get sand from established systems and I'm not talking about a lot or maybe a cupful that helps to seed that sand bed and get that other bacteria and just all your critters in there. Um, and then just wait, it's just patience after that. I mean, yeah. really not anything magical. Um, I know people have done things like dropping, uh, shrimp in there and, um, you can also just dose ammonia. You can just buy straight ammonia and dose that. I've done that before in the past too. Yeah, they, I like they have killing kits. the bacteria route. They have kits now. Like you can just buy the bacteria, buy the ammonia, buy all the things you need, and just you know follow the instructions, and you can cycle the tank that way. That's I easy. just I don't I just don't know. I'm I'm still on the fence. I've got a, a friend of mine who wants to get rid of some of his uh, of his live rock, and I'm like, gosh. He's got a great looking tank. I'm sure there's pests because there's always pests, but I'm going to have pests at some point, right? I'm not going to escape that. I'm just going to have to deal with it with, you know, utility fish or, you know, uh, you know maintenance and cleaning and things. So I'm, I'm it really depends not. depends on your quarantine setup. If you yeah. quarantine correctly, you can keep a pretty high percentage of pests out of your system. But you've got to quarantine correctly. You've got to know what you're doing. You've got to do your proper dips. You've got to do dips in a way that you're killing the entire life cycle of the pest you can yeah. you can achieve it yeah and it saves you a lot of time and energy and money if you can do it right so what would, but what would you, you have to be patient like yeah, from a from time. from your standpoint sarah how would you guys start a new tank would you start with live rock from a different system or would you start totally new um it depends so uh i've done both a big thing is going to be I, I mean, I haven't found I have a preference for one way or the other. Um, I like the ability to have that more sterile environment if you can do it, uh, just from a, a time suck standpoint. Biggest things for me is managing your bacteria during your cycle. So a lot of people think you can just throw it in, you're done, just wait until it goes through. But there's water chemistry changes, things like that, that are going to have an impact on the effectiveness of that bacteria colonizing. So managing your KH, making sure that your KH isn't dropping because that bacteria as it grows is going to be using um, the carbonate out of the water. So your KH can drop. Making sure that you have enough oxygen in the water is also going to help. Keeping your DO above six is going to improve your chances. You can also raise your temperatures. That's going to help the bacteria grow quicker. 78 to 82 um, is great temps for getting your bacteria to grow faster. If you manage all of that, it can help prevent bigger issues from exploding using either the dry rock method, dosing with ammonia, or using live rock. But you have much more to deal with if you're using live rock that you just unknown variables. Yeah. The more variables you add into a situation, the harder it is to pinpoint what the problem is. Yeah. Uh, Jealous7846 says, Remy, you should order some actual live rock from Gulf Live Rock in Florida. Your tank will mature much quicker and the ugly stages will barely happen. Their premium live rock is awesome. And after talking with Keith last time, I think he pulled three mantis shrimp out of his shipment of <laughs> you know, live rock that's maricultured in the ocean. So I don't know. I don't know if I want to be trapping mantis shrimp. <laughs> They're cool. And don't get me wrong, like the amount of like inverts that you can get on that stuff and macro algaes and things like that is really cool. But I think I'd, I want it on maybe a more uh, smaller system, maybe an experimental tank or something like that. 
instead of you know this you can bad get all that stuff though you but and you can control it so you can get the macro algaes that you want and only the ones you want and you can get the critters and animals that you want and only the ones that you want but it's i don't know if you're rolling the dice when you go with wild live rock like that yeah well i think that's two different styles so you can uh, do you prefer a more curated reef keeping experience or do you prefer working and adapting to the the nature of it if you really want to see new things crop up, adapt to the nature, figure out how to highlight the the things that come in or the, the surprises, if that's your style, no. go with that live rock. <laughs> but it's not everybody's style. <laughs> if you want a more curated experience, really picking and choosing, taking your time, going with that more sterile initial approach is going to set you up for better success. So I think a lot of it, too, is understanding what kind of reef keeper you are, what kind of person you are. And that's going to help you be happy with the choice you make. Yeah, I would prefer the tank not be on fire when I come home. You know, like Some oh god, there's like a new critter it. and the, the something something else I have to deal with. Reef keeping's hard enough to throw these random variables in that you may or may not be able to overcome. Yeah, it's foot long crabs. You know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't know what I'll do. I still haven't decided yet. Uh, I'm waiting for the inspiration to hit, but, um, I think if I do, I really want to do a tank with Mariculture live rock. Um, but I don't know if it's this one. I don't know if it's this one. I'm looking at the one across the way that the four foot tank that doesn't have anything in it yet. And that looks like it might be, might be fun to do. So maybe one that's easiest to reset. Yeah. Yeah. I like that idea. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll obviously keep everybody posted on this, uh, Red Sea via video and on the podcast, but it's fun, you know, getting water in there and it's just like, uh, like we've talked about before, it's a new beginning and a new ecosystem. And I'm really excited to, you know, I've been thinking about the fish and all the different corals that are, that will eventually go inside. So getting that plan together, that's for sure. Uh, I want to get to... The Florida stuff, uh, Sarah. We've got you here. You're kind of our like our Jim Cantor uh, <laughs> Johnny on the spot. On the yeah, yeah, but you're not out in the weather right now, which is uh, unfortunate. <laughs> I really wanted a I shot failed, of I'm you, sorry. like the wind just <laughs> whipping by you, and you know, rain. Just put and all a that fan kind of right stuff. here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I will set this up with you called me probably three weeks ago, maybe two weeks ago. We talked on the phone about this really cool project that AZA had for, you know, they put out a volunteer um, opportunity for all the uh, AZA, I don't know, members, I guess you could say. And the Florida Reef Track, obviously, with these warmer waters that are going on right now and the, the bleaching event that's happening right now, there's there's some sort of mitigation that is happening or you know you're trying to save different genotypes and that kind of thing i sat on you sent me a you sent me a call a media call uh from the uh, national oceanic and atmospheric association and i gotta say that was the most fascinating call to be on because it was like scientists it was you know people that are working in the reefs uh in the florida area and i learned so much from that call but i think the thing that stuck out to me the most is i was like what if i'm the only media outlet here <laughs> what if what if reef builders is the only one on this call and they come to me for questions and stuff but at the end of it the first question i think was like cnn or something and i was like oh man this is like legit this is real <laughs> stuff here and then like you know msnbc and cbs and all the like new york times is on this call and i was like okay it's legit, <laughs> but just can you kind of like a weird, to a weird link? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can you take me, take us through like what's going on? Obviously we know the, the waters are out of control and, and warm right now, uh, unprecedented temperatures are happening, but what, what's going on? What's your mission while you're there? What's kind of happening to the coral that's in the Florida reef track? Yeah. So when I reached out, that was, a day or two after I had found out, um, there was a call put out to AZA Florida Coral Holders and 
institutions who specifically worked with Florida coral. So we were looking for expertise caring for Florida coral specifically in land-based capacities. And the reason for that was because multiple different practitioners, so these are nonprofits, government agencies, are using the Keys Marine Lab as a staging zone when they pulled 5,000 coral out of the ocean because the ocean itself was getting too hot for those coral to survive. They were already seeing bleaching. This was, they were pulled in July and the bleaching event was going to get worse, not better. Um, so they pulled all these coral to try and save these genotypes. Um, and what they found very quickly was that these practitioners who are incredible, phenomenal keepers of coral out in the ocean we're dealing with a very different ball game than what they were used to. So th this is land-based nurseries are just different. Keeping coral in a box is different than keeping coral in an ocean. And so they were reaching out to AZA Aquarius to come down and support care. One, to give them additional manpower. They're dealing with 5,000 coral. These are 60 different large trays worth of coral that have to be cared for, managed, inspected, to make sure that you're catching bleaching, disease, anything like that from spreading. Because the coral are already stressed, the chances of bacterial infections, illness, viruses to take hold and run rampant like wildfire through a system is really likely. Um, so they put out a call for volunteers. I was one of the volunteers and two separate teams have come down um, from across the country to support these practitioners. Uh, in uh, daily care, to give recommendations, to help them with choosing additional equipment, to figure out lighting cycles, support feeding, all kinds of different things, just using our expertise of caring for coral in boxes <laughs> to help support them. And they'll most likely be holding these coral for at least another month. So one of the things on the call was, and someone had brought up the point of, okay, we've got a couple hurricanes that are coming through the area, and that actually could cool the water a little bit. Did that, I mean, is there any indication of that so far? Um, not that I've heard. Granted, I'm not on all the calls. Uh, last, The most recent thing I've heard is they're planning for at least another month with the coral out of the ocean. And there's still coral out there. There's still coral in nurseries. There are still coral that hey, they've tried other mitigation strategies. Right now, because this is such a, you said it earlier, unprecedented event, they've had to tr try a variety of different things to see what might work best. And so they're throwing the kitchen sink at it. What's your day to day? Like, what are you, what are you tasked with while you're there? Every day is a little different. So usually we just check in with people, see what help they need. Lots of scrubbing, so much scrubbing of algae because uh, they're trying to manage feeding everybody. They're dealing with so much light. I think that's something a lot of reef keepers don't realize is the, the true vast difference between your lights and the sun. Um, so they're working under the greenhouses are 80% shade cloth and we're still seeing par levels in the tank at a depth of 12 to 16 inches of like 350 micromoles. Wow. So it's nuts and it grows algae like crazy, even though these systems aren't even recirculating. These are single flow pass through systems. They still manage to get a ton of algae. Yeah. So that's a big one. Checking coral for tissue necrosis or, or paling, things like that. Lots are of these, different stuff. Are these open systems or closed? Open. Okay. Yeah, and but they have some sterilization components in place to help prevent any, hopefully, things, nasty things from getting into them. Yeah, it's interesting. They were talking on the call about how, uh, you know, a lot of the questions that I said, like CNN and CBS and these New York Times, it's it, people that are outside of this realm. So they're like, well, why are, why are we even trying to save this in the first place? Like, why do we even care? But it's... Can you t like for people that are also wondering out there, like why does why does the Florida Reef Track matter? I know, but like Florida Reef Track drives like um, millions and millions of dollars of economic value for the for Florida. Uh, so it's a huge driver of economy 
through tourism, through uh, supporting fisheries. When it comes to coral reefs, they support about 25% of all life on the planet, like all animal life on the planet. So it's a really valuable ecosystem. If you like your sushi and your seafood without all of these reefs, uh, we will not get to have that. And when it comes to the Florida Reef Track, from a coral standpoint, a lot of the coral that make their home in the Caribbean and the Florida Reef Track really can't be found anywhere else. They're a very unique genus. They're things that we just don't have a match in the Indo-Pacific. So losing these coral in this highly imperiled ecosystem means we say goodbye to these really cool, unique species. So have you had a chance to go out on the reef at all? Have you had a chance to look at this stuff? (laughs) We've been stuck on land, Um, not in a bad way. That's where our expertise is. These practitioners, they know what they're doing in the ocean. That is their home. That is where they are experts in ways I could only imagine. For us, our expertise is on land. So we've been the most effective and the most helpful in supporting them in the land-based caring for the coral. And then the the plan is just to hold them for a couple of months, right? And then move them back? Yeah, the hope is once the temperatures start to cool off, they can move them back. There was talk about um, holding them for a little bit longer, um, or I guess setting up for longer at I one think, point. Yeah, I think there's definitely conversations now as something like this has happened once. Mm-hmm. Is it going to happen again? and starting to figure out better strategies so it isn't a scramble. It's setting yeah, so ourselves I don't up know, for success. I don't know how much you can say or not, so I'm just going to ask you, so if anything is said, it's blamed on you and not me. <laughs> but <laughs> Totally. Thanks. Thanks, Raj. <laughs> can you share anything about those plans that, or some ideas that have been put forth about um, systems that they – or? just ways that they're going to house these corals uh, for a longer period of time. I wish I like actually knew. (laughs) (laughs) So I could, could give the conspiratorial no comment. (laughs) I, those aren't necessarily conversations I'm involved in, (laughs) unfortunately, as, as much as I'd love to be at the top. Um, I think there is a lot of conversations though with the main, entities who support so NOAA's involved FWC is involved they're going to be doing a lot of work in identifying what they can and can't do the AZA Florida Reef Track Rescue Project was quite successful so that could be utilized as a model again as having these kind of genetic arcs across the country but for very different reasons a lot of the boulder corals a lot of the acropora um there is a lot of those genets are spread across multiple institutions. There's lots in the ocean. There's lots on land. When it comes to the boulder corals, uh, so like Orbicellas and Mentastrias, those, there's less genetic diversity. There's less of um, individuals of these high-value genetic genotypes. Um, so they're a big pressing concern. Yeah. Well... I definitely was not in one of these meetings because I would not never talk about this on air. So it's just something that I heard from a friend of a friend of a friend. But there was <laughs> plans about taking um, just some existing space in an aquarium that systems that were, let's say, designed for elasmos and getting those geared up to house corals for a little bit longer. That way, Mm -hmm. you know, some of the considerations there, obviously, um, lighting is a big thing because sharks don't need the lights that um, a coral would. Solar powered Um, shark sounds like a bad sci fi movie. (laughs) Well, the sharks always get equipped with lasers. (laughs) Solar powered lasers. (laughs) Yeah. And so there's a, there's a lot that uh, a lot of talk about getting that and what all was would be involved in doing that and you know the more you start unraveling and getting into it and you it's not just okay it's going to take this many lights but this system was never designed for that much power because when it was built it was built 
um, you know, for a specific purpose. And yeah. so, yeah, it's, it's really kind of interesting when you look long term and, and using existing facilities, you know, all of the hurdles that are that are in front of us, really. Yeah, and that's something that they've run into. So the Keys Marine Lab is a really cool facility where they work with researchers who come in, use their spaces, but they don't necessarily uh, care for the, the animals. And they have corals sometimes at some parts of the year, but they have other things other parts of the year. So it's, it's very variable. They weren't designed to keep coral for longer than like a couple of weeks. That wasn't their purpose. So now that they're at full capacity with like every table pretty much full with coral, they're running into problems of like having enough amperage to run powerheads and being outside and a lot of the commercial or like the hobby powerheads available have controllers that if they you know, look at them with a drop of water to stop working. So we were like zip tying and zip lock bagging things in preparation for the weather this past week and in a lot of ways that's not necessarily the most sustainable approach so figuring out how you <laughs> to your point do you try to keep adapting spaces or do you just make an investment and build something that's going to work sanctuary yeah right but building something takes a lot of time a lot of time a lot of money lot it of takes money. people knowing what you actually need you know, like right. Florida, I mean, it takes like years. Slope into a right. drain. Yeah. Yeah, and in years, you can lose Absolutely. all those corals that you're trying to save. Yeah. So a lot of this is yeah. is short term. So even though it's on yeah. it's on years, it's still short term mitigation of a long term problem. On the call, they they had talked about how this is the eighth bleaching event, seventh or eighth major bleaching event. Um, do you think that it would become the practice to do exactly what is happening right now, where we can kind of forecast the warmer waters coming, start pulling coral, you know, for a couple of months and then putting them back into the ocean. Do you think that would be a, a common practice for the future? I think that's tough to say. I mean, it's a lot of man hours. It's a lot of coordination you're you're take it would be like i feel like pulling in a bunch of redwood trees <laughs> like <laughs> certain times of the year right i think there's a lot in the next couple of years i could foresee it probably happening as they figure out longer term ways to mitigate the issues but i think there's also you know hope too that it doesn't have to become a permanent event <laughs> what's the uh what's i think the overall... nobody knows What's the overall morale there? I feel like, you know, us landlocked, especially, you know, us in the middle of the country, we see the videos, we see the photos and the pictures and all of that kind of stuff. And it doesn't, I don't think it hits the same as it probably does for you who's there in the middle of it right now. What's the, what's the vibe there? Is it, is it hope? Is it uh, depression? Like what, what's, what's the vibes? There's a lot of hope. Um, I think that's something that I've been really impressed with is how dedicated, motivated, and hopeful everyone here really is. Like, I think that it's not very often you get to work on a project where you have such a ta like tangible proof of the good you're doing. Um, so everybody is doing their best, even if they have losses, even if things aren't going quite the right way, to be open to adapting, to be really... There's a lot of humility in asking for help, which I, is something that I keep being blown away time and time again on the institutions who have been working with the Florida Coral, is just how much humility there is there, how willing people are to, to ask for help. And that's something that I think is critical to the success of these programs, is people willing to collaborate, willing to crowdsource ideas. Um, so it's good. It's been a really great week. Uh, we feel like we're able to really support the teams here, and they've been so gracious and wonderful having us here. That's such That's a strength. Such a strength. Yeah. yeah, just knowing that you need help and then being willing to ask 
that's yeah. a huge, huge strength. Yeah, it's. And I think it's, it's a testament to this to our industry that yeah, we're we're so willing to ask, and everybody's so willing to give. Right, like people just jump right in, and they're going to help you out. Um, it's just such a great community. Definitely, yeah, and I see the foundations of it on both sides. I get to work a lot with the. The, the zoo and aquarium industry, but it's to your point, something I see all the time on the reef side of everybody being so open and willing to help. There's so many Facebook groups and just every avenue people can help each other. They try to, and yeah. it's, it's awesome. Not every Are industry there... is like that. Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you about the radio industry guys. Um... <laughs> <laughs> We're just over here in like happy fun land. Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's no hope in radio. I'm just letting you know that now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any, uh, I, I know that uh, also I keep on referring to this call, but uh, on the call they had talked about how they wanted to preserve, you know, one, uh, each genotype that was specific to the Florida reef track. Um, are there any, as you see them, are there any more than the other, like a more staghorn, more elk horn, you know, more of any specific genus species than others? Um, definitely a lot of Acropora. Um, so a lot of Acropora cervicornis, um, a good amount of Acro Acropora palmata. Stumbled on that. Um, more va variety of bouldering corals. So Dicocinia, um, Dendro, so pillar corals. There's a, like a... a very big mixed bag, and the size is wildly, vastly different. So you'll have a frag this big, and then you'll have like a colony that's like this big, <laughs> all over the place. <laughs> I just I, I know that the uh, the former Worldwide Corals Farm uh, they've just got some really nice sized pieces in there. You just don't see that in the hobby, and we we gripe about that all the time on this podcast about everybody's just got these little tiny frags of everything. And you don't ever see mature colonies, but that's interesting that you said that there's there's so is active fragging happen happening in in this situation, or is that just how they're kind of coming in off the reef? It's how they're coming in off the reef. Um, a lot of the the little tiny corals are um, sex like offspring, so they're they're sexually distinct offspring. Hmm. Uh, more sexual reproduction than asexual reproduction. There are more amputations than fragging. So you'll see people cutting off dying tissue. Uh, I, the distinction, right? Amputation is going to be more in line with <laughs> preservation yeah. of tissue, saving health. So even though it's the same kind of mechanism as fragging, it's you're doing it for a very specific health reason. They're not really fragging coral. If a coral gets like dropped or something like that, they would collect all of the different pieces, tag them accordingly as like A, B, C, D, E of like this particular ID number. But the goal is to keep the coral as large as possible because those are sexually mature coral. Once you get coral of a certain size, I think it's, it's not even that big. Um, there's a great Jamie Craggs paper where he talks about breeding coral uh, in human care and talks about kind of like the rough size when a coral starts being sexually mature. You can have sex. We've talked about this. You can spawn coral in your tanks. You just got to let them get big enough. But yeah, yeah their goal uh, is sexual reproduction because that is going to help preserve the integrity of the reef track a lot better than monoculture as well. Did I hear that that happened? They had a spawning event happen? Um, I think there was a spawning event at KML, yeah. Um, so one of the, there, I mean, this is the time of the year where these coral are supposed to be spawning. So having to bring them in, they've gone through a year of conditioning to be ready for like that one night and they're not going to let anybody stop them. <laughs> yeah. I've actually reached out to Jamie. Uh, he's, he's been on holiday, f you know, cause every other country in the world gets to go on holiday for like a month at a time. So, um, <laughs> but I, I've reached out to him cause I think we're going to, we're going to try and start a little project with him that I think will be really cool. Uh, to kind of expose the hobbyist to, you know, spawning in the home aquarium. And he's he's kind of made 
made that simple for himself at least you know to the point where he's doing it in his kitchen um but uh, i don't think that that's I, I don't think that it's well known enough in the hobby yet and i think that that's what i would like to expose so we've been we've been kind of going back and forth on that but yeah that paper is that paper is super interesting because it's all hobby grade stuff like you said um like you guys are using there that's it it, it kind of blows my mind because you know you you talk with a Raj who's got all this commercial equipment and you know that kind of stuff but you know you're using mp40s and mp60s I'm sure and CJ pumps and all that kind of stuff in these in these greenhouses is there is there a pump of choice is there like a brand that that sticks out more or maybe a brand that's donated some of this stuff um at the moment it's just what they can get their hands on uh so it's um what is available here in the keys with the storm coming through there were things that like couldn't ship overnight uh we actually needed amino acids for something and julian sprung at two little fishes was able to hook us up with 10 gallons of acro power wow. <laughs> to help support support um nice. he, i was able to call him up and be like hey this is a weird question but like we pick up tomorrow <laughs> all of your acro power. <laughs> um, so we sold out. So if you need any of that, it's going. <laughs> no, we took like no, the commercially it, large. Side. Going to a good home. So <laughs> saving the coral. But I think that's that's again, it's an, a part of this industry. Is usually when you need help, you can rely on the people in this industry to help you. He didn't even question it. That that was the best part. It's like, yeah, sure, I can have it tonight. Yeah. Um, Oh, yeah, I love how much drive up there and get it. <laughs> I love how much crossover there is on hobbyist grade equipment and and you know like you said like supplements and things like that from that to like the zoo world and into even you know the commercial run nurseries and stuff like that. I think that that's uh that's pretty cool because we're all using the same stuff. Should that be the yeah. case? I don't know, but <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the hobby drives a lot of the like the reason that the zoo aquarium world can use a lot of this stuff is there's a drive within the hobby for better things. So more accurate controls, better pumps, giving you nicer flow or giving you more variety of flow. So having this large, very well-funded market for these products, because this is a large industry really helps the nonprofit side because we have access to these incredible things at a relatively reasonable price yeah and the for-profit market helps with sponsorships you know the manufacturers Absolutely. are able to then support the mm -hmm. nonprofits with all their different programs wholesale and pricing things like that yeah. supporting these conservation efforts so there's an opportunity to give back which is critical um for a lot of these conservation efforts to mm -hmm. to function or be as impactful as they are so another know... great oh go on go on you're good i was gonna say another great person um in line with jamie craggs is carrie o'neill at flack uh, so florida aquarium at their coral conservation park she's like the cutting edge woman on coral uh florida corals in probably the country if not the world carrie's fantastic she's a wild ride definitely a a phenomenal person she's so smart every time she talks i end up reading like six papers to try and understand something she just innately knows <laughs> it's incredible and again it's very humbling to talk to carrie but she's a fantastic has fantastic insight and just a funny funny human I think she needs to be on the podcast. I, I I know of her. I've seen her in podcasts. I've seen her speak and, you know, give talks and things like that. So I'm definitely lurking, but we've never like physically met before. So, uh, but she, yeah, like you said, she'd also be a great resource on the spawning stuff too. She's we been, need to go visit. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. I've and talked to her about it and she's looking forward to it, but you know, we need to let things calm down down there now. Yeah, they just weathered some stuff. Just a little bit. <laughs> Just a little bit. But yeah, she has bred coral in that haven't been bred before in human care, multiple species. So she she's a valuable resource. I know we've talked about 
kind of your observations as to what's going on there, but is there anything that we haven't covered that really sticks out to you while you've been there? Uh, I think one of the biggest things is just the importance of managing coral health. I think that's a, that's a big takeaway for me. Like a lot of the, the lessons I've learned in caring for coral over the years are really applicable to helping in this situation, but the reverse is true too. A lot of the things I'm picking up and learning in this situation are really applicable to caring for my reef. A lot of the, I think a lot of people enjoy their coral, but don't necessarily pay attention to their coral as much as they should. And the biggest thing we've really had here is when something starts to go bad with coral, it usually goes quickly. Uh, the only thing coral does fast is, is die. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the unfortunate truth. Um, so paying attention to tissue health, there's some really cool work we're trying to do with different types of baths and supplements to nutritionally support coral better, so to give them more of a fighting chance when they're compromised or stressed. Um, but all of those, really focusing in and paying attention to your coral is huge in protecting your reef as a whole and acting quickly. I think a lot of people just wait to see if something will ch- get better. Yeah. And sometimes it might, but the longer you wait to fix coral, your chances of success exponentially decrease. Yeah, I love that for a video if idea. You're seeing I th- RTN. I feel like next time Oh, sorry. Yeah. For- I feel like next time I'm in Colorado and and with you, we need to do a video on kind of coral triage and, you know, if it looks like this, then yeah. kind of pay attention to this because I think that there are too many hobbyists including myself at times where you just kind of go Oh, the, the tissue looks a little bleached or it's receding. Mm-hmm. Maybe a water change will do that. Maybe a water change will help it. Maybe a dip in whatever, but you don't really know what you're doing. I feel like you've done this so many times and you brought some corals back, you know, to life. And I feel like your experience there with, you know, baths and dipping and things like that and making sure that they have what they need. Uh, I think that'd be very interesting for the, for the hobbyist. Yeah, it's something that I uh, didn't know I would be as passionate about as I've started to become. But having to, uh, like you said, triage coral or or get coral to recover when you're not dealing with the nice fancy coral that's on display at the store, but you're dealing with these kind of more rough and tumble pieces or things that have have had a hard knock life, um, it changes how you view the process of caring for them. And the way it changes it, I think, is still really valuable and applicable to healthy coral colonies and managing those healthy coral colonies. So I think that'd be a great fun idea. All right, prepare yourself. I'm coming to, <laughs> I'm coming to Colorado. Heard, <laughs> heard, heard appropriately. We're going to look at bugs. We're going to talk about coral health. <laughs> no spiders. Probably drink some craft beer. <laughs> <All day>. Yeah. <laughs> um, Raj, do you have any more questions pertaining to this? I I, I have one more, but I don't want to wrap yeah, it just yet. Up. Okay. Yeah. I was just going to ask, you know, okay, we're all passionate about this hobby. We're all passionate about corals and fish and inverts and all the things that, that are in this hobby. How can, if I am a hobbyist, how can I support? How can I help? How can I um, push forward the efforts that are, that, you know, that you're at the forefront of right now? Yeah, I think there's a couple different ways you can help support. A big one is visiting your local AZA institutions. A lot of zoos and aquariums fund this conservation work through gate admission. So being able to visit these facilities helps them keep doing this really awesome, cool, fun work. Um, That's really valuable and important. In addition to that, in the hobby standpoint, being really conscientious of supply chains, things like that, being a better steward of Indo-Pacific animals can help us stave off issues in the Indo-Pacific, allowing us to focus time on the Atlantic, uh, particularly the Caribbean, and just general pushing for policy and legislation and things like that that help protect these really valuable ecosystems. All of those are great ways to be supportive, even pushing big companies within the hobby to give back, I think are, are wonderful ways to expect better and expect more from our industry to support the very foundation of it, which is the ocean. Yeah. 
I think you may have mentioned this earlier, but I feel like one of the big things that does affect a lot of people when hurricanes come through is that the coral reef really protects from storm surge a lot of times. And that's the biggest thing that you always hear about here is storm surge is going to be 15 feet or storm surge. And again, to us landlocked people, it means nothing. We deal with tornadoes and, you know, hot weather and things. So that's a totally different ball game. But, uh, you know, storm surge can really do a lot of damage. And without the coral reef to at least resist it a little bit, that's a that's a big issue, or it can be a big issue over time. Yeah, uh, and I think that's that's something that is a recurring theme. We don't know what we have until we've lost it, so we don't know how dramatic the impact of the loss of these reefs would be. But we know it's not going to be good, and I feel like historically, when we think things aren't going to be good, they're usually way worse <laughs> than we we're, we're an optimistic species. Mm-hmm. We're like, oh, that won't be as bad as we <laughs> thought it was going to be. Um, so, and and the big thing is, right, when all this coral dies, it's still there. It's still a rock there. The issue is that it doesn't maintain, it gets eroded, it doesn't keep maintaining that barrier. So as time goes on, it can be really detrimental because it's not holding down, it's not holding on. So I think that's something, too, to note that there, the impacts might not be immediate with Realizing the the impl- or realizing how bad it can get because it's going to take time to get there, and once it's lost, there's no replacing it. There's no saving it. There's no hail mary. It's it's gone. Yeah, I think a good a good example of that is COVID. I mean, look at all of the stuff we're just now feeling three years after that started from supply chain issues to inflation and all the other stuff that happens you know it's just a delayed effect from okay the event is happening the event is over and now here's all the ramifications of that event and i think that that's something that people don't think about but i think if you could put it into that context it's like oh yeah i we all live through that we know we get that so maybe maybe apply that to the coral reefs as well well the ocean too is a the best land-based ecosystem to compare the ocean to is a desert and these reefs are oases in the desert if the oasis goes away so do all the animals so does all the life it it becomes barren and you're losing all of these industries that are critical to the foundation of florida you have entire islands that are for tourism and sport fishing and scuba diving and so like that's gone. That is no longer there. And the economies that rely so heavily on those resources are gone. And there's so much potential in research there. I mean, all medications oh. and things like that. There, I know there's skincare products that take advantage of uh, corals and what they found in, um, I think it's Gorgonians. Um, but w- we don't know what the potential is yet there. You know, we don't know what cures lie in the coral reefs that we may need. Like look at uh, mantis shrimp. The eye of a mantis shrimp was used to create a camera that could see cancer cells based on how the the eye was formed. There could be the cure to cancer in coral. They've definitely done studies on different toxins and things like that pulled from certain corals. We, We don't know, it's a gamble. And it's a really big gamble to take in the future. Disclaimer, don't go eating zoanthids, okay? Pallies, oh, no, just no, no, don't. No, no, that won't cure cancer. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't go just They're good at killing coral. other things. <laughs> yeah. They're going to defend themselves, okay? <laughs> yeah. On the don't lick it tour, zoas and palithoas. Don't <laughs> yeah. lick it. Um, that's a... Disclaimer, I didn't even think I had to put on here, but I'm glad you did. Yep, it's out there. It's out there <laughs> Please now. Please don't see me. <laughs> um, I, know this, I know this episode is a little bit different than, you know, our typical episode, but I felt like, you know, Raj and myself and everybody at Reef Builders, this is, you know, this is one of those things that we all have to be paying attention to because this does affect not only, you know, Florida and the economy and storm surge and all the things. But, uh, you know, I think at the very core of every hobbyist heart is the preservation of coral and the animals in the ocean. So 
uh, I really felt like it was necessary to bring Sarah on and, you know, Sarah's in the thick of it right now, which I think is, is so cool to have that, you know, you know, boots on the ground and you're, and you're there just kind of observing and helping and then reporting back to us. So wish, wish I could be there, wish we could be there to help out as much as possible, but, um, uh, really appreciate what you're doing for sure. Thank you. I appreciate your guys' willingness to talk about all of this because I think it's, um, to, like you said, it's really important for the hobby to, to understand what is going on and be aware of it because sure. it impacts them. Yeah. Raj, you got anything else you want to, any other questions or anything you want to talk to Sarah about? No. Um, we'll be billing you for this time, Sarah, for hanging out with you. As usual. <laughs> As usual. Got to pay for, for friendship. <laughs> um, well, if you have any questions, as always, for either myself or for Sarah or for Raj, uh, please leave them in the comments section below on YouTube. If you're listening to the audio-only version of this, uh, you can always reach out on any of the social networks that we have. And uh, we will see you in the next episode of Reef Therapy. Thanks for hanging out. See ya. Bye, guys. Bye.